everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to Plain Speak, where we explore the dynamic intersection of e-commerce and customer experience against the backdrop of all the exciting new tech and AI developments and customer support in 2024. So thank you for joining us over lunch. I'm your host, Liz, and today we are super lucky to have Jessica Schulte join us on the show. Jessica brings a wealth of expertise in e-commerce subscriptions cultivated through her leadership roles at Grove Collaborative and other prominent brands. With a background rooted in art and a passion for transforming customer engagement, Jessica has spearheaded innovative strategies that redefine customer loyalty and oper operational experience in the digital age. Super excited to have us share some of her insights in managing teams, leadership, leveraging data-driven personalization, and integrating all of these new exciting advances in customer service technology to different benchmarks within this industry. So thank you all for joining us as we delve into Jessica's journey and talk about e-commerce experience, leadership teams, and everything beyond and above that. So Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Super excited. Tell us a little bit about where you're calling in from, and then we're going to talk just a little bit about your journey and path into the world of customer experience. Yeah, awesome. So I am based in Maine, uh, just a little bit north of Portland. So right near the water, which is great. I'm originally from New York, though. I've been up here for about a decade, and I'm currently the VP of CX at Javi Coffee. Welcome, welcome. So how did you take yourself all the way through there to come to be VP of customer experience at Javi? It's been a really interesting journey. Um, honestly, I am an art school kid. I went to SUNY Purchase in Westchester, New York, for, and I was in their creative writing conservatory. And I was convinced that's all I was going to do. I was going to go on. I was going to get my MFA. I was going to stay in the city. I was just going to be an artist. That's it. Love, Love it. it. Um, and I loved that experience. I went on to start my MFA and halfway through it realized I was just kind of disenchanted with both Manhattan and the program itself. And it just, I was missing something. So on the side, I had been building my career without really knowing it. I was working with a company um, that did high-end consignment, no longer in existence. And um, I was, I kind of helped fix stores for them. So if they were having team issues or they needed to open a new store, I would go in and do that. And I looked at it as just like a fun side project and I got like a discount on awesome clothes. I was like, oh, this is great. Amazing. Yeah, right? It was amazing. Um, and then when I decided to make the exit from grad school, which was a difficult decision, um, but it was also a really easy one. Cause I was like, this isn't right anymore. That was the first big pivot in my career into looking at like, okay, well, what am I gonna do next? Like I thought this path was the one that was for me. It wasn't. Um, and at that moment in time, um, another company called Alex and Ani, which you might be familiar with, they had those charm bracelets. We all had the stacks of them in like the 2010s. Nice. Um, a recruiter reached out to me and brought me in to open a store and that just escalated. Um, I opened a couple stores for them, which is how I ended up in Maine. But really what I found to be very interesting was it actually did tie back to my degree in creative writing and my experience um, in the academic world. So all of my work is very character based. So when I was very early on in that journey, in art school, I realized I really needed to understand the brain and how people worked in order to create characters that people were going to believe. So I dove deep into any class I could take within um, my school in psychology, every type of social psychology book, organizational psychology. I even got into neurobiology at one point. <laughs> um, recently, wow. I just finished a class in neuromarketing. So looking at marketing from the standpoint of neuroscience mm -hmm. and that all of that education correlated directly to leadership. So I'm standing, I'm sitting there with these teams of, you know, 50, 60, and thinking that I'm completely underprepared to manage these teams of people and realizing like, oh, actually like all of this work and study that I did for something completely different translate mm -hmm. perfectly into this world. Um, so that's when I really started to hone my experience in leadership and dive into that side of my career. And I moved out of brick and mortar. I moved into e-com. There's several steps along the way, but the next big one was Grove Collaborative, um, which was a life changer, a game changer. I met some of my best friends still to this day, learned so much and spent four years there where we grew 
the customer experience team from about five people that came on at like the initial founding to within a year, a 200 person customer service organization. Wow. It was massive and wild and honestly was a little bit too big. We ended up scaling back as we became more efficient and really found our groove as a company sure. and was with them through uh, public exit and then into retail and eventually my skill set kind of wasn't needed anymore. The team was in a functional place. Um, like, unfortunately, many companies, there was some downsizing. And I decided to jump in one of the waves and go out on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I started consulting for a bunch of other subscription-based consumer goods brands. And that was a great two years. But I got really lonely. It was just me and my dog in my home office. And he doesn't talk in your plants. Yeah, in my plants. Um, and so right around the time that I was starting to think like, okay, I need something more out of my career. This is feeling stagnant. A recruiter reached out to me from Javi Coffee and I was like, oh, this is a cool product. I met the co-founders and I was like, all right, I like these guys. Let's yeah. And that brings us up to today. So somehow all of what I'm doing now relates back to my experience in art school, which I never would have thought would have been the case. It's so fascinating. I feel like so many of the folks that we talk to in customer service, it's sort of like it sort of found them, right? Yes. So what you said made a ton of sense. Where when you think about you know creating characters and really understanding them inside and out, mm -hmm. that I can see how that translates to managing people and understanding their motivations and how they you know think about that, and even just from a branding perspective, you know we'll dive more into sort of e-commerce and subscriptions mm -hmm. and all of that. But on this topic of maybe, you know, leadership and growing a team, I can't imagine going from five to, you said it was five to 200 people. Yeah. In a year. Tell me, maybe share a little bit about what you've learned about leadership there, how your approach towards that has changed over time. Mm. And yeah, how you do that? Yeah, I think... Um, the first the thing I think of is, is like, I don't know, that was crazy. <laughs> that was, it happened so fast. But I think, again, very early on when I was at Alex and Ani in my first leadership role, someone there said to me, just be a human. And I think that individual maybe was a little bit jaded at the moment, but I was bright eyed. And I was like, that's great advice. Just be a human. And that has carried with me through everything. And so the approach I take to my leadership style, and I hope is what others would say about my leadership style, is I do look at the human first. So even if that means like we're slowing down a little bit to have a conversation about your day and like, you know, you're having a rough day. Well, what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, allowing that space for that to happen, especially in the op CX e-commerce, it's go, 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 grind, grind, yeah, grind. It's a daily hourly deadline. Yes. So some people look at that as slowing down as a negative thing like okay we don't have time to do that but really you need to make time so that's kind of the foundational element of my leadership style but then with the scaling it really started with hiring people that i trusted very very much um and you obviously have to grow that trust over time you don't have one two three interviews and are immediately like yes we're going to be best friends and you are the perfect fit for this job um but growing that trust so then they were empowered to hire people that they trusted and it was giving other folks autonomy within their own leadership making uh, making their own decisions to hire fire coach up, coach down, really giving that leeway and also allowing for creativity for folks to come forward and say, hey, I have a really good idea on how we could fix this or change this, even if it wasn't their position to do that, even if it was a frontline agent who was like, hey, this process isn't working. Um, <laughs> just allowing that yeah. space for folks to come forward and be a part of it versus just work for the company. Yeah. You know, it strikes me that, you know, customer experience is really the sum of every single touch point and every single conversation yeah. interaction that your customers have with your brand. But in a way, customer service teams also have that same challenge because you have to operate at sort of interaction scale, mm -hmm. every touch point, every conversation, every ticket, every you know phone call. But you also have to, when you're up to, you know, tens or hundreds of agents, really have to operate at a very quantitative scale as well right? Because every single piece of feedback just can't fil fil filter all the way up. How do you think about managing that as you scale? You know, when you think about bubbling things up to the exec team, what's the balance between those two sides that sort of engages the team? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And honestly, it's 
one of the favorite elements of what I do in my career is you need to speak the language of every single department in the company. And that is the key to success in getting across the feedback from the customer. Because, you know, marketing, they're going to care a lot more about the feel. Like, how does this make our customers feel? What do they think about this? Ops, they're going to be like, what's the bottom line? What do we got to know? What are the numbers here? Where's the issue? Let's go fix it. And yeah. CX really like is the child of marketing and operations in a lot of ways. So you start there, but then even like, speaking to your technology teams, understanding like what's important to them, how they work, like what are like what sprint are they in? How what's the best time to communicate to them? Like, hey, this thing that you just launched like really is not working. What is what kind of data do they need? So I think like that is where to start with communicating out that information is just understanding each department's needs and then how they want that information delivered and communicated to them which is hard. That's not easy, but it's, I think, really effective. No, it makes a ton of sense. Um, and then when you think about that, right, so obviously there are sort of quantitative sort of big picture type things, but I know in our previous conversations, you've talked mm -hmm. a lot about really listening to your frontline agents. Yeah. Where does that fit in between the, hey, this is how many customers complained about this, and yes. then hey, this is how we fill in the qualitative? Yeah, absolutely. So I think whether you are remote or you are in person, you should be sitting with your frontline agents, whether that's physically or remotely. Everybody, not just the person who oversees CX, but every person who has any decision making power, any touch point with the customer, they need to understand what the customer is saying. And it's so much more powerful to listen to a phone call or read through comments on social media than it is to have me just come to your leadership meeting and say, this is what people think and are saying. Because it's very easy when you're getting all of that information thrown at you from every other leader to just be like, oh, this is this is maybe just what Jess thinks is happening. And this is her opinion that she's distilled down. Um, going to the frontline agents, going to your frontline leadership, talking to them, listening to them, sitting with them, because they are listening to your most important important cohorts of customer as every single day for two reasons. One, those are the folks that had an issue that you can fix, right? Like, yep. sure, your brand is doing great, amazing, but you always want to be elevating, doing better. So where are those holes? But then two, these are some of your most engaged customers because they've actually taken the time to reach out to you instead of just saying, you know what? Ugh, I'm just going to go online and cancel my subscription. And I'm just going to give this to my sister-in-law and I don't need this product here. And they don't reach out. They don't want to make it right with you. So if you're not sitting and listening to them, you're missing out on not just that data, but those chances to make the experience better at a company level, not just a departmental level. I like that mindset. They're not just another ticket. That yeah, exactly. They really give me the gift of like coming and interacting and engaging. Yeah, yeah they're people. <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, a couple of things I want to touch on a little bit are, you know, you've done, you've had a ton of experience specifically in subscription, mm -hmm. e-commerce, all of that. Yeah. Uh, but you've also had the brick and mortar and you've also done sort of the, the direct retail. What are some things that you've learned in your career that are very specific to subscription? Because you've stayed in it, you're doubling down on it. Yeah. That filtered through to the customer experience world. Yeah, subscriptions are so interesting because they can be incredibly lucrative for the business, right? It's potentially guaranteed revenue month over month. Um, however, it doesn't always work for the customer, depending on how you have it set up. So it's really hard to balance those two things, right? When, when any decisions that you make, what's going to be good for the customer, what's going to be good for the business. But with subscriptions specifically, it can go wrong very quickly. Um, you could potentially be overloading your customers with product and then they churn because they're like, whoa, I love you, but I have so much product in my house right now. Yeah. I don't need any more. I'll be back in two years when I go through all of it. I can only caffeinate so far every day. Yeah, exactly. I can only have so much caffeine or so much hand sanitizer, you know, whatever the product is. Totally. Um, and then I think also the transparency piece is really important and making, allowing customers, one of the, the major points of success we saw at Grove Collaborative was when we gave more education and also more autonomy to the customer to manipulate their subscriptions on their own. So instead of having to engage with me to understand how to change the frequency of your orders, um, the team there did a phenomenal job of making the website more robust and clear for the customer to go through and take care of it on their own. 
The other piece that nobody likes to hear about subscriptions is sometimes you need to admit that your product is not right for subscriptions. And if you're a company that carries, say, multiple product categories, it may just be some of them. Like, you know, supplements is one that's great for subscriptions because you take it on a particular cadence over a particular period of time. But predicting the consumption of a product is difficult. And you almost have to, an old saying, again, from when I was in, in art school was killing your darlings. Like you might love this idea, it might be the best thing ever, but if you're not listening to your customers and if they're saying, we don't want this, mm -hmm. you gotta make that change and listen to them. I, wait, what's the art school killing, like kill your characters? Yeah, you kill your characters. You might have like a sentence that's so good, but it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. Yeah. It's not serving you or like a character that's just, you know, they're not doing anything here. We got to get them out of here. We got to short, shorten this. We got to redirect. Um, so it's taking that feedback the same way you would, you know, in a workshop and school to, you know, from your customers. Yeah, to really have the, I guess, courage to look at it, look at what's the data saying, what's the yes. quanti qualitative feedback coming back saying. And this really, I think, strikes me because it all goes back to the customer, right? Yeah. Both from a what product, what's, what um, subscription are you delivering them? But then also, and I think for hearing a lot of conversations this year about this, is what type, degree, channel of service do they need, mm -hmm. right? Because I feel like, we're at this really exciting point where there's a lot of automation, there's a lot of generative AI, but then there are also a lot of companies that are productizing ways to actually implement generative AI and automation. And I feel like the conversation a lot of people have been having is, well, well, one, what's good for the company, right? Oftentimes lower cost automation is good for the company, but then also what's best for the customer and the consumer and what they're looking for. What are your thoughts in your world? I think so. I have two thoughts on this. One is um, we need to, as an industry, shift our mindset around what good customer experience is. Yeah. Almost every founder that I've worked with over the past, say, like six, seven years, when you talk about automation or AI and not talking to a human, not talking to a Jess, they're like, oh, but our brand's so great. It's so awesome. We want them to talk to us. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. They want their problem solved. And sometimes that, that usually means how quickly can it be solved? So shifting our mindset to sometimes good customer experience looks like providing the customer an automated solution on the spot when they need it versus waiting to talk to even the best agent in the entire world they might not want to talk to them. And that goes to like the channels that you're working on. Most people nowadays who have like the majority of spend, they don't want to pick up the phone. That's not where they want to be. They need things instantaneously. So shifting the mindset around what good customer experience looks like. And then the second piece of that that I find really interesting is I've only work in startups right now. I have for several years. And that is this place where you need to not be afraid of risk. Even as an employee, you sign that contract. And if this has happened to me, I signed a contract with a company where I was like, oh, yes, they're going to do such great things. And within two months, the whole company was gone. And you're like, well, I knew the risk I was taking. That's part, that's part of this game. But even though you need to have you know, the ability to take risk, not be fearful of it, I do see a lot of risk aversion when it comes to um, implementing new tools specifically within customer experience, not necessarily in ops, not necessarily in marketing. There's always like an A-B test running, like let's try this, let's try that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why exactly customer service is so far behind a lot of times and kind of archaic looking at models that worked for maybe like maybe like a behemoth like walmart or amazon and like they have the cubbies and people are you know in their little boots um but yeah there needs to be a more of a mindset shift i think and i do believe we are going down that road yeah. i think you know, the more more and more companies are adopting um, automation and really, again, listening to their customers to see like they don't want to have to talk to anybody. They just want their problem solved. And to them, that's five stars. That's like super high CSAT. They're going to go write a great review. And that to them is what good customer experience looks like. Yeah. And there are different customer bases and different mm -hmm. segments. That makes a ton of sense. Yes. I mean, my personal th I mean, one theory here, um, TBD, is one, we definitely are moving towards that. But the other piece I'm really excited to see in the world of customer service is sort of like the digitization of like metrics and measurement, right? Because yes. I feel like in 
you know, customer service, even still today, but definitely five, 10 years ago, it's it's very manual, right? You have rooms of awesome people and A-B testing has always taken a little bit longer of a time span, right? It's not like Instagram ads where you can like pop up three versions and you can immediately see your conversion rates change. With customer service, historically, it's sort of been like, well, you know, if you want to make a change, you have to retrain your agents, you have to roll yes. out the training, and it's longer. So I wonder if maybe some of it is that. It's just anytime you make a change historically in customer service world, it takes a little bit longer. And even CSAT, CSAT takes like two, three days to come back. Yes. Right. Um, so hopefully as we digitize and get more instant feedback, mm -hmm. hopefully that'll empower CX leaders to really go and A-B test. Yeah, that's my hope. And I, I couldn't agree with you more, especially on the training piece, because I think a lot of times we don't always look at the hidden cost of that. So the hidden cost of retraining, the hidden cost of the time spent doing that um, just to test something. And if it can be more automated and digitized, like you said, well, you cut out a lot of that cost in time and also the change management and whiplash that happens with your teams when you're like, we're going to do this. Now we're doing this. Oh, we're going back to this. And how here's another new thing, because um, that even for the most talented individual is tough to like your brain to just ping pong around, you yeah. know, every month to 10 different initiatives. No, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, if you have different promo codes, I mean, our, our mindset at High Operator very much is let the human be the human. Yes. And then we try and put all those processes and workflows so you can test three promo codes. You can test two cancellation yeah. policies. Um, but it'll be exciting to see sort of where that goes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And okay, so it's 2024. There are mm -hmm. tons of innovations in customer support. You touched on this a little bit, the excitement of using automation to really lower customer efforts so you can focus human customer efforts in other places. But talk to me a little bit about, you know, what are some tools and maybe strategies that you're excited about? Mm. And then how that changes sort of team management, leadership, and growth. Because one thing, Jess, is that every single person I've met that's worked with you, for you, whatever, has had nothing but incredible things to say about how you've helped them grow in their career. So tell me about new tools and how that changes career trajectory for CX. Yeah, I think that can be a scary conversation sometimes because I think a lot of times when that gets brought up, people automatically think, AI is taking my job. Like that's the immediate like yeah. place that people's heads go. But the, I really think it's the opposite. I think that it opens up more opportunities for even your frontline agents to do more because you're taking out, say like looking specifically at automation, you're taking out the mundane things of like, click, send a macro, click, send a macro. And it allows them one, to grow more, to do more, to be integrated more in the day-to-day -day of how to make the department succeed, focus on their own careers, yeah. um, focus on up-leveling their skills, maybe being more focused in their one-on-ones with their manager to say like, hey, like I actually really wanna get into marketing. like. How do I go from here to there? Um, having tools that support that workload day to day opens up more space for that. It also allows you to spend more, have less agents potentially and spend more time with your team to elevate them and make them super successful, which ultimately makes your department more successful as a whole. Super exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's, no one should ever calculate a price adjustment. That's not a human. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But there are the people that think, well, what impact is that having on experience? What impact is that having on the brand? So that's super, super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, are there any initiatives this year that you're sort of excited or any generative AI tools that you're following or you're like, I wonder? I yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan of High Operator. Um, that's one that I'm you know, <laughs> very, very much a fan of. I think in general, what I'm interested in is I'm seeing a lot of CRMs coming out with their own versions. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to see how those go, because a lot of times um, those sit in beta for a while. And there's so many other elements that are already happening within the CRM that like isn't going to get as much attention. Will it work? Um, will it do what you want it to do? But I think as a whole, I'm interested to see not necessarily specific specific tools, but how the industry really starts to shift. Because I feel like 
the the ball is rolling, the momentum's happening, and more and more people, as much as I've said, like, you know, a lot of this industry feels very archaic right now, I think everyone's starting to see that, okay, we at least need to start to implement things because it's going to be the customer's expectation eventually that this is how they're interacting with us. So I'm very interested to see how that shifts over um, the coming, like, next two years. Yeah. To see where it actually sort of all comes together. Because I feel like there are different pockets where there's a ton of innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see her roll up. And I'm also excited because one thing you brought up early in this conversation was, you know, being able to speak different languages to different mm -hmm. departments, right? Because customer service kind of like, like marketing and ops had a child, but yes. it's like there's product, you know, they're very technical for his products. And I think one thing I'm excited about as well is seeing how all of that data comes together, right? Because you just reminded me now where right now there are a lot of silos of data, right? There's data that lives in your CRM, your contact types, your reasons, your FRT, or maybe your CSAT. There's data that lives in maybe your shop platform, right? And the backend systems. And I feel like there are analytics in each of these. I'm excited actually to see how it all rolls up together. So you can actually close that full feedback loop from customer to marketing, to operations, to tech. Yes. And so bring it all together. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When you said that, the first thing I thought of is like a damaged order, right? Because you get the contact in CX and the agent might classify it as one thing. And then in the warehouse management system is classified as one thing. And then you go back to see who picked and packed it. And then it's just, it's like you said, a bunch of different silos of information. And it'll be wonderful to see that holistic, like one loop of like, here's what happened, here's the reason. It's in one place, not six different spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, no, because like the process engineering yeah. mind part of me loves the idea of being able to lay it all out, change variables, <laughs> see what happens and really understand sort of that whole business. Yeah, absolutely. But all right, we're coming to the end here. I know we have a couple of wrap questions, um, but any last thoughts on leadership or future of automation, customer service? Yeah, I think about? The, the biggest thing uh, for me, like both personally and professionally, I think is not to be afraid to pivot and change course. Um, staying stagnant is such a dangerous mindset or thinking in a black and white mentality of like, well, when I was 20, I thought I was going to do this and this is who I was going to be. If you told me when I was 20, I'd be living in Maine, like working <laughs> for like companies and not like like running around Manhattan, just like as an artist, I would have been like, you're wild. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but the same thing goes for businesses. It's the same mentality to look at your business when you founded it and say, oh, this is going to be the way it is forever. This is the business model that's going to work forever. Staying in that black and white or stagnant mentality is really dangerous. So I would encourage everybody, whether it is in leading your teams, making major <laughs> business decisions, or just in your like everyday life to not be afraid to take those like massive changes and kind of pivot and into something different. It can be scary, but usually the payoff is pretty good. That's true. Leads you to discomfort, high risk, high reward. That's the goal. Exactly. Um, no, I love that. Some personal things I just think about there as well. But <laughs> Each time we do a plain speak, we ask our guests a rolling question for the mm -hmm. next guest. And so your question is coming from Natalie Nichols, the head of customer operations at PathRise. And she'd love to know, very on topic for today, how do you keep your teams inspired and focused through major shifts in strategy? I really like this question because I think it's, it's simple. Mm -hmm. But in execution, it's not. So to me, yeah. and I kind of touched on this earlier, it starts at the point where you're hiring folks. You need to really focus on hiring people that you believe you can develop deep trust in. Because as you're going through major shifts, whether it's in your business model or moving your teams, you know, circa 2020 from being in an office where you're pulling pranks and shenanigans all day to being yeah. home by yourselves, that's a major, major shift. So if you don't have developed trust with your teams, you're not going to be able to be as transparent with them as you need to. Because when you're going through those periods of high change, especially when it comes down to the strategy of the company, they, you need to have high communication. And you can't do that unless you have that foundation of trust. So that sounds simple, but that starts day one when you're interviewing people. That should be top of mind of thinking of like, OK, if things really hit the fan and we have to pivot, we have to do these things, will this person be able to be a person that I can trust, that I can turn to, that I can be fully honest with and not just say, OK, we are uh, we're going to do a full rebrand and that's it. Go do your job. You need to be able to sit down and say, we're doing a full rebrand. This is why we think we should. This is what we're this is where we're headed. This is the timeline. 
And you can't do that unless you have that like real grounding trust in your team, all the way down to your frontline agents. That's not just like your executive team. That's all the way through your company. So for me, that's how I try to function in those times. I like it. That builds towards that trust and the ability to really be resilient. I think I'm hearing a little bit to make those changes when it gets yes. tougher. Exciting. Well, maybe last words, words uh, Jess, um, what's your question for our next guest? What would you love for our next customer service leader to answer for us? Sure. So I mulled over this for a while and I asked some friends last night too. I was, I was happy. There were so many questions I had, but the one that I ended <laughs> up was, what do you think sets your leadership style apart from others in the industry? I'm excited to find out the answer. Yeah, me too. So Jess, Thank you so, so much for joining us today. It's really a pleasure getting your views on everything from leadership to automation to experience and beyond. And looking forward to catching up more. Yeah, thank you thank so you much, Liz. It was really, really fun. <laughs>